everyone see that? Yep. Yes. Great. Well, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be talking to this group. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of my work and start with a bit of motivation on why you should be really fascinated by Mercury as an element, but also as an example of a challenge that's important to sustainability. So thinking about how people have interacted with the environment. And the neat thing about Mercury is that it has a history of that over millennia. Uh, so I'm going to draw both from my book, which actually just came out a couple of days ago. Uh, you can see it here. Um, and as well as some of the work of my research group at MIT. Uh, so I'll dive right in. Um, I'm going to be talking about mercury pollution, but the real goal of, of the book and of my research more generally is to use mercury as an illustration of broader sustainability challenges. And mercury is really intertwined with several of these challenges. And, and these are, are pictures that kind of illustrate that. Um, top left uh, picture here, mercury is emitted from burning coal. So it's really coupled with the energy challenge. Uh, coal burning is one of the major sources of mercury pollution today because mercury is a contaminant in coal. And when you burn coal, mercury enters the atmosphere. Uh, the bottom left, um, that's a photo from Minamata in Japan in the 1950s, uh, where methylmercury poisoning was first identified. Uh, mercury is really also intertwined with human health, um, where more, most people are exposed to mercury is through food, um, primarily through consuming fish. Um, so we're most concerned to, today about impacts at low levels. Um, and I'll talk about the health damages of mercury at both lower and higher level details um, in more detail in this talk. In the top right, that's a photo of, of an artisanal and small scale gold miner. Um, Mercury is used in these gold mining processes and that provides an important source of income for actually tens of millions of miners and their family members worldwide in more than 70 countries, uh, mostly in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And recent assessments have argued that that's the biggest source of mercury pollution to the atmosphere globally, possibly exceeding coal burning. Uh, so mercury is really entwined with a broad range of these sustainability challenges. And because mercury has been mined and used for millennia, there's a lot of examples of how people have used and interacted with this hazardous substance over time that both benefited society and harmed society um, that we can use to draw lessons about sustainability today about how to live in a finite planet uh, so if you think about what's happened over the history of mercury pollution uh, it's actually an industrialization story uh, the Photo, the figure on the left uh, shows mercury in concentrations in the Arctic and in different kinds of Arctic biota. So it's normalized uh, to today's levels that are 100%. But as you can see, the levels um, in the 1200s and 1300s and the 1500s, there's, a, there's an unfrozen polar bear in there that uh, died in a glacier that they can measure the mercury in. But those levels were something like a tenth as they, of the, what they are today. And really, you can see the industrial signal of rocketing up mercury concentrations in the Arctic. And that's really reflected worldwide. Mercury travels globally. It's a global pollutant that poses risks to human health and the environment. And I'm showing here um, the, an excerpt from the UN Environment Program's uh, global scientific assessment that it conducted back in 2002 it found that there was sufficient evidence of adverse effects of human, on human health and the environment from environmental releases of mercury to warrant global political action to address these issues. Um, mercury is a neurotoxin. Um, it travels globally through the atmosphere and deposits to ecosystems and then transforms into the form of methylmercury, which is a potent neurotoxin. So there's a global treaty to address mercury, and the treaty is called the Minamata Convention after that town in Japan where methylmercury poisoning was first identified. And that entered into force in 2017. So mercury poses dangers to human health and the environment globally, uh, but the health impacts of mercury depend both on the form people or mercury people are exposed to and the amount of that exposure. So many of you, when you think of mercury, you might think sort of chemically, right? Um, it's an element of the periodic table. It's the only liquid um, at room temperature. And you might think about old thermometers, for example, um, that, that funny liquid. That's the elemental form of mercury. And when people are exposed to elemental mercury at levels that are dangerous, that's primarily in occupational settings. Um, so one major use of elemental mercury to, today, as I said earlier, is in artisanal and small-scale gold miners. 
And exposure to mercury vapor at really high concentrations um, of that elemental mercury once it, it enters the atmosphere is dangerous. And some of these impacts have been known for centuries. Uh, so when mercury is mined, the conditions in mines were well known to be hazardous to workers over 500 years ago. Um, so these are some neurological damages, um, you know, dif difficulties in coordination, and some even more severe um, neurotoxicological impacts. Um, but concentrations such as those that exist sort of in ambient, in the ambient atmosphere, or even what you'd be exposed to if you break just one thermometer, are not typically at levels that are dangerous to human health directly. Uh, that said, if you do break a thermometer, you should probably open a window, um, dispose of it properly, make sure you're not sniffing it. Um, but most people in industrialized countries, um, in the US, also in Europe, are exposed to mercury in the form of methyl mercury, and that's primarily through diet, and that's largely through fish. And the top right, I'm showing a magnet that I got from the US EPA um, that said, due to high mercury levels, women of childbearing age and children shouldn't eat these particular fish, um, which are high in mercury. And the impacts of most concern at lower levels are also on the nervous system. Um, babies born to women exposed during pregnancy um, are particularly affected. And at high doses, you can see severe damages or even death. That's what occurred in Minamata. Um, but at lower doses, um, damages involve development of the nervous system and cognitive development. And the statistics shown here was that in the early 2000s, it was estimated that more than 300,000 babies were born in the US every year to women whose mercury levels exceeded US guidelines that were intended to protect against these adverse neurodevelopmental effects. So, Dr. Um, so, so yes. was the U.S. Uh, considered, in terms of the number of babies here, were there different other parts of the, of the world or continents that had, you know, this kind of statistic? Well, so the U.S. has the most data on um, sort of average concentrations. Um, I, I'm not sure if I have the, um, I don't have the slide here, but there are populations across the world, particularly populations that eat a lot of fish that are highly exposed. Um, so in the U.S., it actually tracks with um, sort of two different things. One is coastal populations who eat the most fish. Um, so populations on the east and, and the west coast are the highest. Um, and also both the wealthiest populations, um, because some certain kinds of fish like swordfish and, and sushi are expensive, um, and low-income populations, subsistence fishers, um, Native Americans. So it's a really interesting pattern of exposure in the US. And in other countries, you can think about, um, so I was at, at, actually at a, at a mercury meeting in Japan and um, the Japanese diet has a lot of fish and the average concentrations, you could actually measure your hair mercury constant levels. If you go in, um, they'll cut a piece of your hair kind of from the back of your scalp and you need basically a cubic centimeter of hair. And what they'll do is they'll measure the mercury concentration, which gives you an idea of your blood concentration. And the concentration in the Japanese delegates was about three times higher in general than the international delegates. And, and that's really a function of how much fish you eat. But that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, but, so the most concern is on the part of um, pregnant women, uh, women of childbearing age, and children. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't affect other adults too, um, although those effects are a little bit more uncertain. Mercury can cause cardiovascular impacts such as heart attacks in all adults. Um, so it's really something that, that everyone ought to be, ought to be concerned about. Uh, but I do have some good news for you about fish. Um, I couldn't give a talk to the MIT Club of Rhode Island without talking about calamari. And calamari is relatively low in mercury. I really wish I were there visiting you so I could eat calamari, um, but I can at least give you the good news that it's relatively low in mercury. But that said, there are a lot of fish that's, that are high in mercury. And if you think about sort of where those emissions are, it really tracks with the pattern both of industrial activities, um, as well as the signal of artisanal and small scale gold mining, which is that um, those high levels in the tropics. So the largest emissions are actually in Asia. Uh, coal use in China and India is particularly high. Uh, mercury emissions in the, both the US and Europe have declined quite a bit in the past several decades. 
And this is a result of emission controls. Um, some emission controls for other air pollutants also reduce mercury emissions. And these controls and other controls have been implemented in several countries. Um, but mercury emissions actually are likely still going up, despite the fact that in 2002, the UN Environment Program identified mercury as a global challenge and um, the kickoff of, um, of negotiations towards the Minamata Convention, which entered into force in 2017, the latest inventory uh, said that there was a 20% increase in global mercury emissions between 2010 and 2015. So it continues to be a problem. And a lot of that is, either, is both growth in coal and growth in artisanal and small scale gold mining. But one of the really unique things about mercury is that it's an element. So it's impossible to get rid of, you know, an element. You can't, you can't create it, you can't destroy it. So once it's emitted or released, it actually continues to cycle between the atmosphere, land, and ocean. And that cycling can, can occur for decades, to centuries, or even longer. Um, so if you think about today's piece of, of tuna sushi, um, that actually on the left is a, is a sushi plate that I had at a Mercury meeting for the Minamata Convention in Japan back when we could actually travel. Um, and that piece of tuna would then contain a combination of naturally occurring mercury. So it's a natural element, but that's a really small fraction. So mercury emitted by volcanoes and, and things like that. Mercury emitted recently. So today's power plants and today's artisanal mining but also a substantial chunk of mercury that was emitted decades to centuries ago that continues to cycle in the environment and accumulate in fish. And one of the fascinating things about mercury is these historical sources stretch back centuries to millennia. Um, one of the last trips I took before the pandemic was to the Almadane mine in Spain. Um, and that was one of the most um, productive mercury mines in the world. Um, over its history, it produced more than 250,000 tons of mercury, and it operated for over 2,000 years, and it just closed in 2002. Um, it's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so it's not operating, but they give tours. You can go down and, and tour the mine. Um, but most of its mercury was exported to South America, where it was used in silver mining during colonial times. And some of that mercury may well be still circulating and end up in that tuna sushi on the left. Um, so that's both a scientific challenge, but it's also a social challenge because you have mercury that's traveling across borders through trade and then traveling through the atmosphere, coming into the sushi, um, getting eaten in various places and having impacts. And you have to really track that and or all of those things in order to understand the problem. Uh, so that hopefully gives you an idea of why I think the connectedness in history makes mercury a really good case to think about how people have managed their interactions with this simultaneously very useful but very dangerous substance. And this really was what prompted us to write, write this book, Mercury Stories. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons from the book, um, particularly on mercury as a sustainability challenge, but I'll also show some of the methods and approaches that my research group at MIT uses to try to help understand issues that, like mercury pollution that are relevant to human well-being across a number of different dimensions. And just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that, that I do, um, you know, you might think about environmental studies by um, looking at the behavior and impacts of just what's going on in the environment. So geological, chemical, and biological processes. But what I hope you learn from the introduction is that it's really impossible to understand the mercury challenge and all of the things going on, similar to other sustainability challenges, without looking at some other kinds of processes. And that doesn't just involve what's going on in the natural environment. Uh, so you have all sorts of technologies that play a part. So you have power plants, you have production processes, you have mines, built infrastructure that can lead to emissions. And you have what's in the environment affecting humans, people and their communities. Uh, so where you fish, what kinds of fish you choose to eat, whether you choose to eat fish at all, um, where you live, um, what your job is can affect um, your exposure. But it's also not a linear system either. People react to those impacts. And through increasing knowledge and building institutions like the Minamata Convention, they in turn modify technologies in the environment. Uh, so if you're trying to understand mercury as a holistic problem, you really need all five of these components. You need humans, you need technologies, you need the environment, you need institutions, and you need to 
understand the knowledge compartments in order to fully understand what's going on with Mercury. And that's really the perspective that we bring to the book, which looks at five Mercury related systems. And each of, the each of these systems is a focus of a chapter in the book. Um, and I'm gonna focus um, this talk on two of those, um, one on human health and one on en energy industry and pollution. Uh, but there's also chapters that specifically look at Mercury and commerce, uh, Mercury and artisanal mining, and uh, the global cycling of Mercury. Um, so I'm happy to take questions on, on that when, when we get to the Q&A. But to um, set up the health challenge, I wanna talk about, um, start with a question that was actually asked by my asked of my research team several years ago as we started a study looking at the impact of mercury and other pollutants. Um, we were working with Native Americans in Michigan, in the, North, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And we were working together with researchers at Michigan Tech. And this was the, the Keweenaw Bay Indian community. And for this community, fishing and eating fish was important to their culture. Um, but the fish had high levels of mercury. And we held a workshop at the beginning of the project and they had a bunch of questions. And they said, well, where is this mercury coming from? Is it coming from local sources? Is it coming from regional sources? Or is it coming from across the world? Um, what can be done about it? Or what is being done? What's the effect of different policies, both at the national scale and the global scale? And importantly, what does that mean for communities on the ground? Ultimately, when will these fish be safe to eat? And under what conditions? And the way we can sort of break down this challenge, um, one of the things we did in the book was to think about sort of the interactions and really formalize the pathways that really affect mercury as a challenge. So you can think about these industrial uses of mercury and the emissions contaminating ecosystems uh, near or far from sources. In order to get mercury into methyl mercury, there's a lot of ecosystem processes and transport and, and transformations either nearby or across the world whether that happens in, um, in lakes or ponds or whether that happens in the ocean. Um, methyl mercury is produced, it accumulates up food chains. And then seafood poses health damages to consumers. Also, I will mention that rice also contains mercury in highly contaminated areas. Uh, we did a project on, on methyl mercury and rice in China in particular. Um, it's not all rice, but if you have a, an area that's actually really contaminated by mercury, mercury can accumulate and some of the um, if you're in a high, highly contaminated, high rice eating area like China, it can be the dominant pathway of exposure. Uh, so in order to dive into some of the details of these processes, um, my research group has to use a variety of different kinds of techniques. Um, so to look at sort of what those industrial uses are and the technologies, um, we can do engineering analyses, but sometimes we also have to do interviews with policymakers and figure out um, how to develop scenarios of what might happen under different circumstances. Uh, to simulate the transport of mercury in the atmosphere, uh, my group uses a tool called GeoSchem. That's a, a global scale, finely resolved three-dimensional model of atmospheric chemistry and transport. And that can tell us how mercury travels from place to place and the reactions that it undergoes. And we've linked that also to ecosystem models uh, which simulate the production and accumulation of methylmercury. And we can also layer on exposure and health impact analysis. Uh, so that's giving you a sense of, of one of the simpler pathways, um, but actually things are a little bit more complex. Um, for example, in, in the treatment we have in the book, we also include uh, the process of harvesting mercury contaminated food. And also that seafood and rice can lead to health benefits. In particular, fish contain important nutrients um, polyunsaturated fat fatty acids, and those contribute to brain development. The impacts on people can also depend on their biology as well as socioeconomic factors. Are they economically able to switch to other sources of dietary protein that might be safer? Um, so if you think about what kinds of interventions can make people safer from mercury, you can think about intervening at different ways in that pathway. Um, and so we can think about first um, regulating emissions and releases. So you can stop the mercury from being emitted at, um, at its source. Um, but if some of that mercury that's currently in the seafood is from decades to centuries ago, there's not much you can do about that now. You can address the future part of the problem and the, the problem, the part that's occurring now. Um, but that's a, a partial solution. 
So you could also think about addressing where and when people can fish and, and where they can sell fish. A third one is providing dietary advice for consumers, but you have to take into account both the potential harms and the benefits. So encouraging people to eat healthy fish, um, not avoiding fish altogether, and also be sensitive to cultural and local contexts. And these kinds of actions occur at different places along that pathway and can be implemented by different actors. And to give you an example of how you can evaluate the prospects for actually making things better, um, I'm going to talk in the next few slides about how to trace the impacts of emissions regulations and what they imply for exposure. Um, so I'm going to give you an example from the US, the mercury and air toxic standards, as well as a global example from the Minamata Convention, uh, drawing from the research that we've done. Uh, so in 2012, the US Environmental Protection Agency announced the mercury and air toxic standards. And that regulated mercury specifically for the first time from coal-fired power plants. Um, and you, you'll note that I said that emissions are, are going, have been going down for a couple of decades because of controls. And that's because really of, of benefits uh, to mercury from controls that were designed for other pollutants. But coal-fired power plants were still the highest uh, emissions in the US and you needed mercury specific controls to actually get them down any further. Uh, so these came in in, in, uh, in 2012. And because in the 2000s, mercury contamination was still a problem, even with those declines, for example, for communities like the Native Americans in Northern Michigan. Um, so if you take a look at the figure that's on the stand next to, that's the, um, the then EPA uh, Northeast Regional Administrator um, who was announcing the mercury and air toxic standards uh, in East Boston. Uh, the figure that's next to him was actually comes from a study that I did that looked at the fraction of mercury that's depositing to the US uh, coming from sources within relative to outside North America. So mercury is a problem throughout the US. Nearly every waterway has an advisory about eating fish from it due to mercury contamination. But the source of that mercury differs. And that's because mercury is emitted from polluting sources in a couple of different forms. One of them travels long distances and one rains out quickly. So mercury is simultaneously a local and a global problem, as well as a near-term and a long-term problem uh, because of its continuing cycling once it deposits. So you have to take into account a bunch of different, both temporal and spatial scales in analyzing mercury. And so we did this analysis using our global scale atmospheric chemistry transport model. Um, and you can see that uh, for those who eat fish or harvest fish in just generally the Northeast US, um, primarily downwind of the uh, coal fired power plants that were in the uh, Ohio River Valley, um, addressing that source would go a long way towards solving the mercury problem, um, eventually by reducing those inputs. Um, but if you lived in northern Michigan, that's less of a, a, a big impact. Places where mercury is also depositing and leading to fish advisories, uh, most of that mercury is from international sources. And that could potentially include power plants as far away as India and China. And of course, people in the US don't just eat the local fish. Um, you also eat fish from the global oceans. Um, so you really need a two-pronged approach um, to address mercury contamination in the US. And that's really the, where the Minamata Co Convention comes in. Um, this was a group of students I took to negotiations of the global treaty, the Minamata Convention, uh, back when it was finalized in January, 2013. It was in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and it actually fell during IEP, so I was able to, to take a whole group of students there. But one of the questions that um, sort of people, have, people asked, and in particular, uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency asked at the time was, well, what are the relative benefits of these domestic standards versus what might happen globally? Um, and what impacts would that have on, on the US? And so we were interested in, in tracing that, um, following that entire pathway I talked about earlier. So transport, deposition, um, uptake in fish, and consumption. And in order to do that, we had to create emission scenarios consistent with the two policies then use our global model to calculate the resulting deposition. And the results are, of that are in the two graphs on the top. The domestic standards shown on the left reduce um, deposition in some areas of the US quite a bit. The global policies result in a more widespread decrease. And then we used information on exposure. Um, again, that um, survey that tells you where people are exposed and what kind of um, what kind of fish they're eating, because we have a lot of data on that, to compare the impacts of this on US seafood consumers. 
And we can actually quantify some of the damages avoided. Um, we can quantify the impact on cognitive development via avoided IQ points lost for newborns on heart attacks for the US population. And then we're able to use an economic model to uh, monetize those damages in the US economy. Um, and again, using methods that were consistent on how other regulations are evaluated. And we found benefits in the billions per year in the domestic standards, tens of billions for the global standards. And the fact that we have a lot of, um, a lot of different lines there, we did a lot of uncertainty analysis, um, but order of magnitude, think billions for domestic standards, think tens of billions for global standards. And you know, we, we published this in, in, in 2016. We had done this work 2014, 2015 after the Minamata Convention. We were actually sort of broadly interested in comparing the two. Um, and the mercury and air toxic standards had were pretty much coming into force. So we didn't think that this would be particularly relevant to the domestic standards. We thought it would be really interesting to the to answering the question of what global treaty impacts on the US were. But it turned out that they were actually quite, um, quite impactful in thinking about the US mercury rule. Because the US Supreme Court in mid 2015, um, as this paper was under review, weighed in and made the statement um, based on some earlier EPA analysis that the EPA had issued a few years earlier. Um, and they claimed that using standard regulatory methods, the quantifiable benefits from reducing hazardous air pollutant emissions, including mercury with this rule, would be four to six million a year. And we said, well, wait a minute. We did a lot of uncertainty analysis here, but remember I said it's in the billions. Um, and said so that's that's an order of mag that's a couple of orders of magnitude error, right? And it turns out EPA had only done a partial analysis of the mercury benefits and they quantified benefits only for people who consume freshwater fish they catch themselves. So recreational fish fishers and their families, and only for a subset of applicable health benefits, so only for the IQ deficits. And EPA calculated that these partial benefits amount to four to six million a year. And you can think, okay, sure, it's important to understand the impact on recreational fishers and their families, but compared to the whole population of the US, that's why it's a small number. Um, but EPA at that point pushed the rule back, uh, the US Supreme Court pushed the rule back to EPA, and told them to reevaluate the proposal in light of the differential costs, which they estimated in the billions, and the benefits, which they said, well, you said it was the millions. But we had new results that, that actually contradicted that. And when you actually did the analysis, you, sh you can see that, that there were substantial benefits. Um, and actually, by 2015, um, industry had invested in um, the control. Um, the control measures that were necessary and actually had started implementing them. Um, so one of the things we did was we, we submitted a, um, a response uh, to the EPA's proposal and, you know, actually um, sort of said, here's, here's the results, here's what we did. Um, but another issue was, was also environmental justice. Because um, while on one hand, the overall benefits to the entire country are important, it's also important that the burdens of mercury pollution fall particularly on subsistence groups, those subsistence fishers, um, and also the Native Americans, like the community we worked with in Northern Michigan. And so one thing that, um, what, when we think about working with those communities, um, so some of the research that we did was actually linking our atmospheric model um, to ecosystem modeling to look at that in more detail. And we looked at a couple of different scenarios, um, projecting mercury concentrations in fish, actually looking at the lake that that particular community was fishing in. And we looked at this under three different scenarios. Um, so that aspirational scenario in the middle actually zeroes out all anthropogenic emissions. And it decreases mercury in fish um, by up to 65%. But the current policies, which is sort of the, more, the more ones that are actually in place, um, that was only an 11% decrease. Um, so it really showed the, the need for even more aggressive um, declines. But one of the challenges was that none of our model policy scenarios would reduce fish mercury concentrations to the target that would be safe for the local tribe before 2050. So that really meant that you needed both the interventions upstream as well as the dietary advice. And the question is sort of why is that the case? And 
that's the case because of these time scales that I talked about. So the continuing legacy of mercury circulating in the global environment, as well as the mercury that's in the, the ecosystems themselves, that actually creates a lag time in the system. Uh, so one way I've tried to sort of how that happens is you think about sort of the mercury that's depositing globally. And this is just a, a simple model that I created of that. Um, its impact declines over time, but then anything you add to it um, continues to cycle, begins its circulation. So if we stopped emitting today, there's a still a long-term legacy. But on the flip side, what we emit today affects tomorrow. So this isn't too different from the dynamics of the carbon cycle and the climate problem. Um, but you can see that with the schematic, if you look at the historical and new components separately, that's essentially what happens over time. Whereas if you have constant emissions, um, you know, with that historical legacy, the um, deposition keeps going up. And some of the research that we've done in, in my group really shows that the so the longer emissions reductions are delayed, the more historical mercury there is in the system. And this actually has differential impacts. Um, so this was work that um, I actually did with an undergraduate in, in EAPS as part of his thesis and a postdoc uh, formerly in my group. And we showed the degree to which the impacts of a policy reduce taking into account that delay. So for example, if you implement a policy that if you did it today, it would result in a certain percentage decline in emissions. Every five years you delay, you lose a certain fraction of that effect. Right. And that fraction ranges up to 20%, depending on where you are in the world, um, especially in remote regions. So those nearer to sources feel this less before, because most of their deposition comes from nearby present day sources. But in remote lo locations, you would feel that more. So what that essentially means is that eventually you'll delay enough that cutting emissions will just leave you with the status quo. Uh, so this is a really long-term problem on the scientific, from a scientific perspective. Um, but one of, the, one of the challenges is it also seems to be a long-term problem from the policy perspective as well. Um, and that delay is unfortunately a characteristic of policy processes. Um, so the, the fight over the mercury and air toxic standards is not over. The EPA just recently uh, reevaluated that 2016 finding um, on the economics. Um, it's already been implemented by the relevant industries. Um, but EPA found that it, that it wasn't, and this is a legal term, appropriate and necessary to reduce emissions from coal-fired power plants. Um, and they actually, in their, in, in their final finding, repeat the claim that there are only millions of dollars in benefits. Um, they attempted to sort of dismiss our findings because we had uncertainty analysis. Um, this is sort of an interesting ongoing legal challenge uh, to these rules. Um, but, you know, no matter what the EPA decides to do on mercury emissions, they really ought to actually quote the science right. Um, so this was, I'm still trying to do my part to communicate actually what we found um, in the hopes that our findings are really used accurately in the regulatory process. Um, and so one of the things I did last May was testifying before Congress to really show, you know, what we did and what the impacts of domestic versus international regulations on mercury actually has when you trace it through all of this this complexity. Um, so going back to thinking about the, the mercury and, and health system, um, I want to sort of wrap up this part and talking about this chapter by highlighting some of the broader conclusions that came out of our examination of health issues from the book and uh, potentially give you a flavor of the kind of insights we can draw from mercury work that are relevant more broadly to sustainability issues. Uh, first of all, so mercury is clearly a dangerous substance, but understanding its impacts really requires looking at the interactions with technology and society. So environmental processes intersect with cultural factors, dietary choices, dietary recommendations, as well as what's happening from a policy perspective. And those impacts are simultaneously global and local. Um, second, as you think about transitioning to sustainability and more sustainable human well-being, um, this really depends strongly on how different people consider valuation. Um, so the ways in which overall assessments of value in the legal system and how they're implemented um, can actually feed back to influence some of the disparities and exposure that already exist. Um, so a lot of the legal challenges is about that um, overall US figure, um, whereas you know, policies aren't really geared towards necessarily protecting recreational um, anglers and or Native Americans who have very high exposure. And the third is that really effectively governing these health risks requires not only the sort of 
upstream approaches, but applying really different kinds of interventions at the local level, at the global level, um, that involve different points on these causal pathways and really integrate and are sensitive to socioeconomic factors. Um, so I want to pause there. I'm going to talk a little bit. I have a couple of more slides um, for another maybe 10 minutes on, on energy and pollution, um, but I want to have a short pause just uh, because I know Zoom gets a little tiring and just uh, just ask you a question um, and take any, any that, that I have from you. Um, I want to give you a flavor of some of the historic nature of mercury as a substance, the fascination with it over the centuries. Alchemists actually used mercury uh, quite a lot and, and tried to use it to transform lead into gold. Um, and they had a lot of names for mercury. And here are five different names um, that four of them were actually names for mercury and one of them I made up. So my question is, which of the following was not a term used by alchemists to refer to mercury? Anyone wants to uh, to guess in the chat? I'd be um, be happy to. Uh... We have silver fox. Silver fox. One guess on green lion. Green lion, yeah. Oh, two guesses on green lion. Green lion seems to be the. Uh... Oh, secret furnace. Hmm. I wonder which it is. Any other guesses? Mother egg. Mother egg. Ooh, so pretty much Mother you're all sure that, that Venomous Dragon was one of them? I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. All right, I'll give you the answer. Um, it actually is Silver Fox. The only one that's silver, which is actually what most people think of as, as Mercury, is, uh, is the only one that was not used. All of the others are alchemists' terms for Mercury. Uh, so. Hopefully that gives you a flavor of, of, of some of the really fun things. And, and in the book, we have a lot of fun stories about mercury. Uh, one of my favorite ones actually is um, that mercury um, was actually used in a lot of medicines. And during the Lewis and Clark exhibition uh, expedition, it was used in laxatives. They were called thunderclappers for their effectiveness. Um, and so mercury, as I said earlier, mercury is forever. Um, 200 years later, you could actually track and researchers actually went and tracked the route of the Lewis and Clark ex expedition by measuring the mercury concentrations in the latrine pits. So that one of the fascinating uses of mercury and, and we have a lot of little anecdotes in the book um, that are that are related to that. Um, but, you know, I want to go to some of the really um, really important issues of, of energy and, and industry in the in the last couple of minutes I have here um, to talk about some of these emissions um, and talk to you about sort of how some of the technical issues can affect emissions control and then what impact those have. Um, so returning to the type of visualization I showed you earlier with the pathways, um, the pathway that involves pollution control of mercury emissions, you can have these air pollution control devices that are designed to capture mercury and other air pollutants. Um, so some of the ones, especially those that are designed to capture sulfur can also capture mercury. Some are mercury specific. Um, so when you apply these, they incur costs and they're passed along to energy consumers. And also once that mercury is captured, you have to deal with it appropriately so it doesn't get released into the environment elsewhere. So one particular type of intervention to deal with this is as the mercury and air toxic standards does and the Minamata Convention does as well, um, to mandate that particular types of controls be applied. Uh, and so in, in the US, the mercury and air toxic standards gets really specific about that. Globally, the Minamata Convention requires uh, the use of best available techniques. And the way the requirement is stated, countries have some flexibility in implementing these, de determining what is both technologically feasible and what's available. Uh, so that's the text of the Minamata Convention. So for, it says each party shall require the use of best available techniques uh, to control mercury emissions. And that's, that has a, a technical guidance document um, associated with it. And so to look at this question in more detail, um, we actually did a study focused on China and India and the power sector. And we did a series of in-depth interviews with policymakers and technical experts to really determine what those technology controls would look like, um, under two different interpretations of the best available technology provisions. So one that was a flexible interpretation and one more stringent. 
And here in this graph, the power sector emissions are in color, um, bluer for China, redder for India, gray is the rest of the sectors we held those constant. Um, for this study. And the different colors represent the different forms of mercury. Uh, remember I told you that power plants emitted in forms that deposit locally and traveled globally. The darkest one here is the one that travels globally. Uh, so under the more stringent policies, uh, emissions decrease uh, from the power sector, uh, not surprisingly, but the forms that decrease are particularly actually the ones that deposit locally, especially in India. But so here's the thing we assumed on the, the um, the bars on the left that all of these um, were from an underlying emission scenario. But when we applied another scenario in which the energy mix was much less reliant on coal, um, we then got lower emissions overall. So that really showed us that um, these, the issue of end of pipe controls on pollutants and climate change are really coupled. And we can further calculate the differences this makes in deposition. Um, so what I'm showing here is the difference it makes to go from the minimal requirements to if you interpret it a bit more stringently. So the extra deposition that would be avoided with a bit more technology. And we show that there are substantial differences and, and that these differences are largely benefits occurring domestically to in India and China. So it suggests that it's in both the global interest and the local interest for these countries to act um, on mercury. But the results from that raise a broader point, and that's the influence on the fossil fuel economy on the mercury problem. Um, so I'm illustrating this with another pathway diagram where fossil fuels enable the operation of industrial sources, producing energy and industrial goods, providing important benefits, but nevertheless emitting lots of different pollutants, one of which is mercury. So of course, for climate change, moving away from fossil fuels is important, and this is a potential intervention as well in the mercury system. But it's also politically challenging the Minamata Convention probably wouldn't be enforced today if it relied primarily on reducing fossil fuels to mitigate mercury. So one question is how these things interact. So do, are we just, you know, buying these end of pipe control technologies as a band-aid solution? And is that even worthwhile to do if eventually there's going to be an energy transition um, according to the Paris Agreement? How do we think about those things together? and also understand and model their interactions, not just physically, but also technologically and societally. And so you can think about sort of the international bodies, national and local governments and industries all with goals on fossil fuel use. Um, so thinking about the Paris Agreement, for example, as well as the Minamata Convention. And that was really the impetus for, for this study, which I did together with a master's student in te technology and policy, um, develop scenarios and look at the impact of those two agreements together. Um, and we focused on China and we looked at all sectors in this one, not just the power sector. And because climate policies reduce the reduce expected fossil fuel consumption, they reduce mercury emissions, but actually not as much as the end of pipe air pollution controls that prevent mercury from entering the atmosphere. Uh, so without any controls, um, we, calculate annual emissions would increase to 1,150 metric tons by 2030. And climate policies under the Paris Agreement would reduce this to 1,035, but air pollution controls would reduce it further to 533 tons. And when you get those two things together, you get even more of a decrease to 490 tons. Um, more stringent climate target, you get another 20 tons. But importantly, that's less than additive. Um, so the end of pipe controls actually reduces the benefit of eliminating source entirely. So this raises some important questions about prioritizing the near term versus the longer term. So if you buy these technologies for your coal fired power plants, this might effectively lengthen the lives of new plants, make climate policies more difficult to achieve. But in the US and Canada, we've actually seen that increased stringency of emissions controls can actually have the opposite effect encouraging early retirements of power plants. So how do we sort of summarize this? The take home message really is that pollution control still matters. Climate change and climate policy doesn't just take care of all other sustainability issues. And you can't really reduce the challenge of sustainability to just climate alone. Um, you have to really grapple with the realistic pathways and their trade-offs for human well-being and think about the technological elements, but also the political elements of, of getting consensus on, on some of these, um, these requirements. So to summarize some of the insights from our energy chapter, um, first, what emerges from the cases we looked at on mercury was that 
incremental actions, these, these kind of small changes, not just the big transformative energy change, they actually had substantial benefits for human well-being, both in the near term as well as in the longer term, again, preventing that, um, that impact of longer term mercury. This was true uh, in history and it's also true going forward and it really suggests they shouldn't be overlooked uh, in a focus on the increasing need for transformative change to address some of our substantial climate and environmental challenges. Uh, second, that the interactions between policies in these different sectors are both physical and societal. So they're not really additive, they're also politically related through common frameworks for negotiations. And this also raises the challenge of how to manage what, what we call sort of governance of the possible. So an efficient solution to the mercury and the climate problem together from a technical perspective, well, you could just rid of, get rid of coal, but that creates political problems, which means that it's not an efficient solution at all in practice to think about in the short term and the long term. Um, managing the ideal versus the possible by maximizing the transition and thinking about what benefits people in the short term, they don't have to wait 30 years, um, will be a challenge for both scientific assessment and implementation. Um, so finally, I want to draw to a close by highlighting a few overall thoughts about ways forward. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that um, mercury is really a fascinating substance and a, and a great case um, to look at the complex nature of issues that relate to sustainability and really think about um, a systems perspective. Um, that sustainability challenges are really inherently multidisciplinary, involving humans, technologies, environments, but also institutions and knowledge. And um, that we can really use that knowledge to design interventions that have clear benefits, um, both in the near and longer term. And ultimately, the goal of my research and, and a lot of my work is to really inform action on sustainability to, to improve human well being um, to address some of these big global challenges, uh, both today and in the future. Um, so with that, I'll stop and, uh, and take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very interesting topic, Dr. Noel Saline. So uh, if you have a question, unmute yourself or put it in the chat, um, please do. I actually do have a question. Uh, it's a fascinating, uh, very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I, I, I'm used to looking at mercury at the um, microliter, micromole level, and it's always fascinating to uh, hear, hear the word from 30,000 feet and metric tons, because uh, that certainly is a part of the story that is very important, and it's a, very exciting to hear the progress uh, that modeling can make uh, and, and has made. Um, one of the things that I want to ask about is, uh, whether or not uh, you considered uh, the uh, exposure to humans from a very widely used um, remedy, um, and that is uh, dental amalgam fillings, which uh, played a role in the considerations of the Minamata Convention and uh, is something, that's, that's the kind of thing that I study in a molecular and biochemical level. So absolutely, and, and we talk a lot about the, the challenge of dental amalgam fillings and also the, the really fascinating history of that in the book. Um, I think the, the key um, sort of conclusion, according to sort of the exposure scientists at this point is that um, sort of dental fillings are sort of a big issue because of the quantities of mercury that are used but that the form of mercury that's actually in your teeth is not an exposure concern for the most part, except for sort of people who are genetically sensitive um, to those who are actually have them in their teeth. The problem really comes for dental offices, for example, where dentists do this all the time and are, are exposed if they're not, if they're not using um, sort of safe precautions. So occupational exposure for dentists as well as environmental exposure. So one of the, um, the really interesting examples is, is from Massachusetts where um, sort of in the, in the mid 1990s, they, uh, the state mandated amalgam separators for dental offices. And you can actually track the concentrations in fish going down after that, because basically we're just flushing mercury, a lot of mercury down the drain. I mean, when you think about these kinds of concentrations that are really small in the atmosphere, when you have a big globule of it coming out of fillings, that's actually a substantial part of mercury. Uh, the other interesting part about um, mercury and dental amalgam is that 
a lot of the, the trade in dental amalgam is actually diverted into um, artisanal and small scale gold mining. Um, so, you know, you have these, uh, I've, I've seen photos that colleagues of mine have taken in artisanal and small scale gold mining communities where um, there's like dental shop. You're like, hmm, I don't think this is where you're actually buying dental equipment. I think you're selling it for gold mining. Um, but that, that is also a fuel of, of, of some of the illegal trade. Yeah, I need to take exception to the comment that the mercury that's in amalgam fillings is not toxic. Um, and I think that it, it in part has to do with the emphasis on methylmercury when it appeared in fish and appeared to cause neurological symptoms. And this was in, I think, the early 70s uh, and got a lot of attention worldwide for that reason. Um, but, and also because the, the dimethylmercury and methylmercury certainly are quite toxic in pure form. But uh, there's the, the highest exposure, and this is, are you familiar with NHANES? Yeah. Okay, so the NHANES- the, um, We used a lot of that data in, in scaling some of our, um, our fish consumption. Um, sure. And that was the first one to raise the flag about mothers and children might be exposed, assuming yes. fish, because everybody was assuming fish. Uh, the loads of mercury from amalgams that can accumulate in the body are extremely high and they're extremely long lived uh, because mercury is a much more stable adduct than uh, the organomercurials. And um, so I just want to point out that there's um, evidence that mercuric mercury, some of which collected by us, some of which collected by others, that mercuric mercury in large amounts does get out of fillings and it doesn't all just blow out when you exhale. Uh, so that uh, toxicology is one of those difficult areas where, where determining exposure is really tricky, and particularly for for mercury, that's the case. But uh, right, so some of the some of the more recent data can actually uh, do fractions of methyl mercury, um, and so you know it's it's really clear that what we're talking about from a from a sort of toxic load perspective. Um, again, there's there are certainly cases where people are particularly sensitive um, to that amount of mercury, but it really is sort of a, a very different pathway um, to elemental mercury rather than methyl mercury that you can actually distinguish between if you look at, for example, urine levels um, versus hair um, concentrations. Um, so, you know, you didn't get into the, some of the details of that, but we get into to some of that in the book. I uh, poked my um, yeah. bibliography into the I haven't, but I'll send that along to you and look forward to reading your book. Yeah, so um, I saw a couple of questions in the, in the chat now that I can see the chat. Yeah. Um, Good. Uh, so the where is mercury concentrated in fish? Um, it's actually sort of in the, in the edible portions of fish. So um, unlike some of the persistent organic pollutants, which um, mostly accumulate in the fat, uh, mercury is, is actually in the, in the, the muscle, the fish tissue. Um, so, Cooking, cooking it differently doesn't really help you. Um, in in that case, it's it's pretty much. I mean, you know, obviously there are differences between fish, but um, and so in rate of autistic children, there's there's really not good evidence at this point for that. Um, the most important um, the most important sort of outcomes are really IQ deficits in um, sort of the general population. Um, sort of neurological damages um, at higher levels. Um, but in the general population, um, we, we, haven't, we haven't seen convincing evidence, evidence for that. Um, effects on red cell production as there is for lead. Um, I'm not that familiar with the, the mechanisms for lead. Um, mostly we're talking about sort of blood blood brain issues. I, I don't think the mechanisms for the cardiovascular impacts are, are that well um, illuminated yet for mercury. Again, they're, they're pretty uncertain. Um, so I, I won't comment on that as an atmospheric scientist. Um, affordable mercury detector for tech testing fish. Um, that, that, that actually, um, you know, it depends on what you mean by affordable. Certainly, um, certainly you can do it in the lab. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, at home, no, <laughs> not something that you can, you know, but actually sort of there are general decision roles. Um, so um, the, the, one of the slides I showed is, is a little wallet from a little wallet card that'll tell you what's generally high mercury fish versus low mercury fish. Um, 
I, I tend to think that the really tasty ones are high mercury, but that's just a personal preference. The swordfish, the tuna, I really like those. Um, but again, calamari, low mercury um, in general. Um, so although there is some variability among different um, sort of actual samples, um, you can usually use that as, as a guideline. And, and there are now downloadable apps that you can get and encouraging you to eat more of the low mercury um, fish, but less of the, the high mercury fish. The small, the small fish are actually uh, very low because they don't live that long, like mackerel and sardines and stuff. Mackerel, sardines, herring, those, yeah, not my favorite fish, but they're very low in mercury and very good for you, I understand, so. Very, very good oils. Yeah. Um, can I ask a yeah, question? I'm missing, I'm missing my fish dinner in, in Rhode Island here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know we're a little bit over, but I was wondering, uh, can I ask a question about the EPA and their estimates? Sure. Um, so it seems like they were way off and there was an opportunity for them to learn to do better. And well, I'm wondering, but, but, or, or maybe I'm being too harsh on them, but it, do you believe their estimates more now that time has gone on? Have they improved? They were so far off. So I actually think that, that it was sort of a, a strategic problem in a sense. I mean, they did those estimates, um, but they didn't actually try to do the whole problem, right? Yep. They just said, yep. let's do this very small subset. I think they did it pretty well, okay. right? Because they did it in a very detailed way. It's just, you know, if you're only looking at a tiny fraction of the population of the United States, you're not gonna add up that even if they have severe impacts. Right. Once you say that, it's, I think the legal system has interpreted that as a, as a, as a number that it wasn't intended to do. Um, okay. And part of that is because it was actually a pretty tough problem to do. And we had to do a lot of uncertainty analysis. Right. Um, right. And we did that three years later, right? They did this yeah. um, sort of in the early 2010s when a lot of the models weren't that well developed. They didn't have a really good database. Um, you know, we developed some of the models to do that. Um, okay. So, so I think the EPA certainly recognized that and, and acknowledged it, at least in the 2016 reauthorization, um, but not so much now. And I think they're um, basically the incentive to do that kind of analysis when there's just a decision that um, sort of regulation should be rolled back no matter what yeah. is, a, right. is a difference, right? I mean, I, right. I, I don't know right. what, the, what the EPA is thinking right now on, on that topic. Right, okay. Yeah, and, they, and, it, and you know, you have formidable kind of horsepower from a technical standpoint that they may not have. And, and so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy problem to provide a, a high quality estimate for. Right, and, and actually our earlier models were used in the EPA's estimate. Um, actually, uh, you know, as far back as the Bush administration, um, you know, I collaborated with the EPA to give them estimates from our modeling for the initial version of the, um, sort of it was the, called the clean air mercury rule and it was thrown out by the courts um, because it put together a cap and trade program for mercury, which wasn't actually um, sort of legal in terms of how they implemented it. So it was thrown out. Um, but we actually provided some of the data that they used um, to do their modeling as boundary conditions um, in some of our early mercury models. So we've been working with the, with the EPA on it over time, but they were done with the rule, right, by that time, and they just needed to re sort of, the fact that they had to redo it was the Supreme Court, all the industry had actually done it, right? It was just, right. and in fact, like, you know, we were, um, we're actually working with the Electric Power Research Institute quite a bit in the early 2010s. Um, and by 2014, they, they pretty much said to us, yeah, regulation of mercury, it's happening. We're just going to invest, like, we're not really going to invest in research anymore because we put the, we, we put the um, control devices on and that's it. You know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. done. We're, yeah. we're going to implement the requirements. The requirements were very clear. Um, so actually a lot of the major, major electric uh, producers are, are not in favor of rolling this back because, you know, it's not like you can take that cost and just say, oh, by the way, I'm going to return that. You know, it goes back to the manufacturer. Please give me a refund now. Right. Like, it's right. a sunk cost. So. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay, so we are pretty much at the bottom of the hour. Have we addressed all the questions in the chat? Uh, I think I think uh, I got all of them, although there's there's 
quite a bit of them, but I'm happy to take any any more if there's a if there's a couple more. Um, Any, okay, so actually I do have one, but I'm going to, yeah. since, uh, so it talks about, you know, the global temperatures, right, as they rise, and then the thawing of um, permafrost, the accelerated mercury trapped in frozen ground, which is now being released, right? So now it's transforming into more mobile, more potentially toxic forms, right? So I'm sure you're very familiar with that. I just want to hear what you think about that. Yeah, so, I mean, the question is, so it's, 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 I'm, it's clear that this is happening, right? I mean, there's there's mercury stored in these areas that, that could be released. The question is how significant is it in the global budget? Um, and that really, I think the, the jury's still out on. Um, so, you know, what impact it'll have locally? Will it mobilize more in those particular communities? Will it, will it actually be in a form that can travel globally? Um, you know, I have a lot of colleagues who, who work on these, these permafrost areas and it's not only how much of it is actually going to melt but really what what happens to that mercury um but there are high levels in it so it's it's, it's certainly a worry that this will actually be a substantial impact um and you know there are a lot of impacts of climate change more generally on the mercury cycle um one of which is is actually interesting um so some colleagues at harvard have done some studies on what fish eat basically, and looking at any one specific fish species with climate change, with shifts in their diet, they're, you know, feeding on different kinds of fish. Think about humans, right? Your mercury dose, if you suddenly decide to eat a lot of tuna, that's gonna, your concentrations are gonna go up. Um, fish don't really think about what they wanna eat, but if climate change forces them to eat something else, their mercury levels could actually change. And, and in fact, some of these, you know, human influences, you know, if you kill off their, their food source because you're eating it, or if the structure of the ecosystem changes, that actually can have substantial impacts on the mercury levels as well. So what we're seeing is that the trends in mercury, you have to really figure out what's happening in the environment and distinguish that from any trends you could see um, from emissions. And I think what, uh, so I'm on the, um, on the, the technical advisory committee that's trying to figure that out and looking at the effectiveness of the regulations under the Minamata Convention. And one of the things that they're really struggling with is how to disaggregate those signals. Um, and, and I think the argument is, is if, if you have this variability and you want to have a signal that's bigger than the noise, you're probably going to need a, a bigger signal. You're going to be need to be a little bit more drastic in your cuts of emissions if you want to see a change, um, which I think is, is hard for, <laughs> for policymakers to get their head around. Excellent. Okay, so in fairness to everyone, I just want to thank you very much, Dr. Salim, for presenting uh, a really interesting topic, obviously, to many people. Uh, you want to plug your book one more time? What's the Sure, it's called Mercury Stories. It, uh, it just came out Tuesday on, on MIT Press. Um, and if you go to mercurystories.org, you can um, actually look at some of the other content we have, including a playlist of songs featuring mercury or related to the mercury problem. Uh, so if you want a Spotify playlist, go to mercurystories.org and there's links to uh, more information about the book there. Excellent, excellent. So this is being recorded, so we'll have a copy of that. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for, for joining and uh, please be on the lookout for other Zoom uh, speaking events. So thank you so much again, Dr. Salim. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. Thanks yes. everyone for coming. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.